Want to be happy? Build a life, not just a business. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and this channel was created to help you overcome the number one challenge that is holding you back, a lack of belief in yourself. You watch these videos because you know there's something more inside you. You've got Michael Jordan level talent at something. So today, let's live your best believe life and learn from some of the best motivation from Will Smith. Skydiving is a really interesting confront with fear. <laughs> so I gotta stand up, I'm sorry, I gotta stand up. <laughs> you go out the night before and you, you know, you take a drink with your friends and somebody says, yeah, we should go skydiving tomorrow. And you go, yeah, we'll go skydiving tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, and you go, yeah, and everybody goes, yeah. And you go home by, you by yourself, you're like, hmm. <laughs> right, you're like, well, I mean, they, they was drunk too. So then that night you're laying in your bed and you just keep <sighs> and you're terrified. You keep imagining over and over again jumping out of an airplane and you can't figure out why you would do that. So you get there and then you have this safety brief and you're standing there and the guys will tell you, well, if the chute doesn't open, what's going to happen is you're doing you. Well, well why the hell, why, what could happen? <laughs> So you get onto the airplane and you're sitting there and, and you know, it's extra because you're sitting on some dude's lap, some stranger. <laughs> trying to make small talk, yeah, man. You, so you, do, you, be, you be jumping with people all the time, huh? You be, so you fly and you go up to 14,000 feet and somebody opens the door. And in that moment, you realize you've never been in a freaking airplane with the door open. <laughs> terror, 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 terror. And then people start going out of the airplane. And the guy walks you up to the end of the thing and you're standing and your toes are on the edge and you're looking out down to death. They say on three. and he pushes you on two because people grab on three. And you fall out of the airplane. And in one second, you realize that it's the most blissful experience of your life. You're flying. There's zero fear. You realize at the point of maximum danger, is the point of minimum fear. The lesson for me was, why were you scared in your bed the night before? What do you need that fear for? Everything up to the stepping out, there's actually no reason to be scared. And then in that moment, all of a sudden, where you should be terrified is the most blissful experience of your life. And God placed the best things in life on the other side of fear. So I do uh, scream to me the other night, hey, Will, I want to be an actor, man. I want to be an actor just like you. You know, usually people say stuff to me like that. I'm like, yeah, man, you know, you can do it. Just give them an encouraging word. But I was just sitting in here thinking and it dawned on me, 99% of people that say stuff like that are not willing to do what it takes to make their dreams come true. The Marines have a saying, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. And that's just real. At the center of bringing any dream into fruition is self-discipline. You know, some, something as simple as food and eating, it's not about your, your body as much as it is about your mind. It's getting command of your mind to be able to choose actions that are in your own best interest. Every day we are choosing that's not in our own best interest, right? So if the world is attacking you and the world wants to fight you and the world's trying to hold you down, so you're going to kick yourself in the balls? So you're going to stop yourself from getting what you dream. Self-discipline is the center of all material success. You cannot win the war against the world if you can't win the war against your own mind. Being prepared for the next thing is so wildly critical. Um, 
I think life in general is rise and fall. Everything is rise and fall. And there's been a couple times in my life where I got caught um, holding on to the last wave while it's while it's dying. Oh, I have a good quote for that. Yeah, I have a Casey Neistat quote, Where Casey which said. is like that. Tar- I don't even he, he probably didn't make this up, but Tarzan can't get to the next branch if he doesn't let go of the yep, first one. Absolutely, and that's, that's kind of that real. same philosophy. Yep, absolutely. And you've got to be when you're grabbing that first one and you're holding it. It's going to be there. It's fantastic, but you got to know like that. that you're gonna to have to let go at some point because the same thing that saved your life, if you hang on, it'll kill you. Also, if you wanna have more self-love and confidence, check out my 254 series, they're free. The links to join are in the description below. I look at the world through a lens of comedy, right? So my natural reaction is always, no matter when something happens and I can't even help it, it's why is that funny? It takes such a desperate, obsessive focus yeah. to, to excel on, a certain, on, a, on the level that, that I want to make movies. Choose actions that are in your own best interest. Every day, we are choosing shit that's not in our own best interest. You have to be able to be vulnerable in front of anybody, you know, you have to be comfortable looking silly, you have to be comfortable making mistakes, and you have to break the thing inside of you that doesn't want people to see, right? Because as soon as you allow people to see, all of a sudden you get access to things that you didn't realize you had access to, right? Um, For example, like a thing I used to do is when I was probably 18 or 19 years old, Um, I got in touch with those blocks. The camera hates emotional blocks. Like you put a camera in somebody's face and they're uncomfortable about delivering emotion. It looks fake and you feel it. You immediately know it's not real, right? Um, Especially look at the size of this screen. And in a shot, that whole screen could be just your eyes. Right? So it's like you can't hide discomfort, uncertainty, so you have to be able to get comfortable, you know, just being anything! (laughs) Anything that you have to be for the role, you have to be comfortable being it! (laughs) I look at the world through a lens of comedy, right? So my natural reaction is always, no matter when something happens, and I can't even help it, it's why is that funny? You know, so even at a, a funeral, I can't help but think why that's funny, you know? So it, it's, it's extremely helpful for me just psychologically that no matter what's going on, I can't keep my mind from finding jokes, you know? So it's a, it's a, a, a beautiful way to stay joyous and positive. Don't ever let somebody tell you you can't do something. Not even me. All right? All right. You got a dream, you got to protect it. People can't do something themselves. They want to tell you you can't do it. You want something, go get it, period. Something that probably a lot of people don't know about me I don't fuck with the ocean. The ocean is like the ultimate woman. She is beautiful and she will nourish you, but she will tear you to shreds also. The ocean is my worst fear. I don't know what it is or where it came from, but there's something about not being able to breathe. I've tried snorkeling before and I was hyperventilating. 50th birthday is this year. I just wasn't going to go into the back nine of my life without having attacked my fear of the ocean. So we're about to scuba dive the Great Barrier Reef. You know, I've never scuba divin, scuba dove, scuba. I've never been scuba divish before. So we're taking the boat ride out go through a storm. Running to you live from a storm on a boat. We're headed out to a dive site of the Jurassic Park. Oh my goodness! Did you feel that? Did you feel that? That's 
watching you in the studio, Sandy. Probably 25 years old in my mind, and I knew that I would be here one day. So I'm ready. I'm ready. Whoa! Jeez. Wow, that's crazy. Is anybody shooting this? Yeah. That's what you call Australian bull. Ah! How you feeling? Awesome. You ready to go get it? I'm ready. I'm about to go take my spot. Look at this. This is stupid. All right, I'm not going. <laughs> Come on, this will be the hardest part of your day. I know, right? <laughs> Is it okay to punch sharks in the face? You're like, back up with your shark ass. Back up with your shark ass. Shark ass, back up. Shark jab, shark jab. Yeah. I got it. The first fish we see is a shark. <laughs> Come on! I'm not doing another dive today. <laughs> the question isn't, can you handle the situation? The question is, can you handle your mind? Can you manage the thoughts and the emotions that are trying to poison your progress? Forget managing the situation. Manage your mind. Training your mind to sit calmly in the eye of the storm. So I was thinking about um, love. I was thinking about how difficult it is for us to find and to, to maintain the love that we all yearn for. And it, it, it kind of dawned on me that I think a big part of the problem is that we misdefine love. It's possible that no other one subject has been more analyzed, talked about, and experienced by every single person on this planet than love. And yet, we really have no clue what it is. So me and Jada was reflecting about love. You cannot make a person happy. You can make a person smile, you can make a person feel good, you can make a person laugh, but whether or not a person is happy is deeply and totally and utterly out of your control. The thing that we call love, the thing that we're searching for and we're trying to create that we call love is actually not love. Jay Krishnamurti talked about the, the concept of the desire pleasure paradigm, that we think about love in terms of desire and pleasure, meaning that if you meet my needs, then I love you. If you don't, then I don't. So that love becomes transactional. If you do what I want, if you meet my desire and give me pleasure, I love you. If you don't meet my desire and you don't give me pleasure, I don't love you. I think that, that in the insatiable nature of desire, trying to get somebody to fill our cup, I think that that leads to, to anger and it leads to uh, frustration and ultimately it makes us break apart from people. My daughter Willow really taught me a hard lesson. I think that the real paradigm for love is gardener flower. So the relationship that a gardener has with a flower is the, the gardener wants the flower to be what the flower is designed to be, not what the gardener wants the flower to be. You want the flower to bloom and to blossom and to become what it wants to be. You want it to become what God designed it to be. You're not demanding that it become what you need it to be for your ego. Anything other than all of your gifts wide open, giving and nourishing this flower into their greatness is not love. The, the, the concept of improving lives runs through the center of everything I do. And then I realized that the, the, the way to improve lives is to continually improve yourself, right? So with that 
every every morning when I when I get out of the bed, you know, I the, I haven't fixed everything in the world yet, so there's always something to do. And uh, in this film, I read a, an interesting quote. Um, for the uh, Siddhartha uh, Gautama, the, the Buddha, he said um, that um, good people have to get out of the bed every day and try to empty the ocean with a ladle, mm -hmm. right? And I thought that was, you know, I, I knew that was profound and I paused for a second and I said, all right, what the hell is a ladle, right? <laughs> Right, so then, you know, I just, I touched it on my iPad, it's ladle. Oh, it's like a big spoon, a big spoon, okay. As we it's say, like a soup spoon, yeah. yeah, it's like a soup spoon. I was like, why are you a soup spoon? So trying to empty the ocean with a soup spoon, you know, as the, the mentality of how you, you wake up every day to try to do good yeah. in, in the world. So for me, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really driven by continually trying to um, elevate my elevate my mind and elevate my spirit and care for my body and um, to be able to love as many people as effectively as as possible with this mystery of life that I've been given. It's challenged for that, right? Like, oh, you're soft, you're different than yeah. the rappers. Ah, Your positivity was always challenged. Like, yeah. people always wanted you to justify being positive. Being positive, so right? Your, absolutely. Your music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that was a that was a uh, a, a difficult time coming up because it's it's like I'm from I'm from Philly right so during that time in Philly it was Joe Frazier and Rocky so a fist fight was common uh, so you grew up like, right. <laughs> you grew up you grew, Chuck, yeah Chuck D used to he called it Pug City mm. he's like Pug City he's like he's like Chuck was like damn you can't go to Philly without getting in a fight right. so it's like I grew up in that so for me to uh, it was always difficult for people, you know, to say I was soft and I was, you know, my 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 music was cotton candy and all of that. So I, I always wanted to fight to try to 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 prove myself. But the be, fighting yourself to maintain positivity is the hardest fight you ever gonna have, mm. right? And it's like that struggle to just stay my course to you know be the person in the world that, that I wanted to be no matter what people said. And it was, uh, uh, I started to call it offensive positivity, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, I wasn't gonna be on defense mm -hmm. with my positivity. I was gonna be on offense with it. Right. I was just uh, having a debate with a friend of mine and we got stuck on the difference between fault and responsibility. And she kept talking about how something was somebody's fault, it's somebody's fault. And I was like, it really, it don't matter whose fault it is that something is broken if it's your responsibility to fix it. For example, it's, it's not somebody's fault if their father was an abusive alcoholic, but it's for damn sure their responsibility to figure out how they're gonna deal with those traumas and try to make a life out of it. It's not your fault if your partner cheated and ruined your marriage, but it is for damn sure your responsibility to figure out how to take that pain and how to overcome that and build a happy life for yourself. Fault and responsibility do not go together. It sucks, but they don't. When something is somebody's fault, we want them to suffer. We want them punished. We want them to, to pay. And we want it to be their responsibility to fix it. But that's, that's not how it works, especially when it's your heart. Your heart, your life, your happiness is your responsibility and your responsibility alone. As long as we're pointing the finger and, and, and stuck in whose fault something is, we're jammed and trapped into victim mode. When you're in victim mode, you are stuck in suffering. The road to power is in taking responsibility. Your heart, your life, your happiness is your responsibility and your responsibility alone. No, no, we're not just bungee jumping out of helicopter. We're gonna do it at the Grand Canyon. And when I was up there and, and I jumped, I realized, you know, it's fun and it's exciting and I, there, there's something mythological about confronting death, right? Because as much as we're laughing and as much as we're having fun, it really is the emotional confront with death. 
you know, and I'm 50 years old now, and I'm, I'm sort of having the realization that you, you, you have to be able to go. You have to be able to take that shot at the thing that you dream. You have to be able to take that shot at that, that love that you want, at that life that you want to build. And it's like, you know, when I was up there and the guy said to me, the only way you can get hurt is if you don't get away from the chopper. Right, and he said in that moment, he said, we're gonna let the cords go and these cords weigh 200 pounds. Right, so when we let them go, they're gone. The hesitation is the thing that really messes up the chance at having your dreams, right? Get out of the middle. But the moment of pushing off is pure freaking terror. And then there's the moment of falling, but you're gone, so it's really nothing you can do. <laughs> and just like life, there's nothing to hold on to. And we're all trying to hold on to something. You're trying to hold on to an idea or you're trying to hold on to a person and there's nothing to hold on to. And we gotta just get comfortable falling, knowing there's nothing to hit, right? You know, and that's the idea. It's like, life is dangerous. And the only way to really enjoy it is jump and be free. You challenge yourself a lot of times. I remember there was even one rap you was like, I dare, I dare a rapper to write a verse. Verse without, without a curse, curse. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so what is it now? You think you've loosened up kind of on that stance more? Like you don't mind? Yeah, you know, for me, it's, um, it's, it's much more about authenticity of duality, right? The idea that right and wrong aren't separate things. They're together, right? So something that happens to you is the best thing and the worst thing that happens to you. You can't, you can't separate them. Mm. Like they go together. Everything has its yin and its yang and you can't get around it. So the idea that my grandmother teaching me um, about profanity during that time was what worked to help elevate my um, career and it helped elevate my experiences, but it's not necessarily right to not curse. Mm. You, you curse when it's the right thing. Not gratuitously. Not gratuitously, right. right. You, you know, it's like when it, when it makes your point, like tell, telling somebody to shut up at the right time you is just, the right thing. You just scared me, Will. Right? <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So it's like um, giving myself rather than specific yeah. hard and fast rules and paradigms, now I'm trying to feel the universe and feel the moments and feel the opportunities for what is right for me in this moment. In the world, I... I'm, I'm always connecting to an idea. I'm, I'm always asked, why am I making this? What, why? So I'm putting this out in the world, why? Mm -hmm. So with, with concussion, Dr. Bennett Omalu was deeply connected to tell the truth. And he said that truth doesn't have a side. And that's what he kept saying. I thought that was such a powerful what that mean? idea. That there, you know, whose side are you on? Are you a Republican or a Democrat? I'm, I'm, just, I'm trying to tell the truth. Truth, the truth doesn't have a side, right? I gotten probably two weeks into my uh, preparation for the film and uh, my father was diagnosed with cancer. You know, and that was another thing that my father taught me. He was, he was joking all the way up to the end, like laughing, you, it, you have to be able to laugh at everything. Yeah. And for me, the beautiful part is uh, that that's my natural, um, uh, color on the spectrum. I naturally go to comedy, you know, and when, when, when I'm looking at something, I'm always trying to find why that's funny. And, you know, it's been really, really helpful in, in this experience and, and, you know, even just uh, this point in my life. Keep remember to laugh, remember to laugh, and, and spend time with people that make you laugh. Like, that is hugely important. Mm -hmm.
laugh and connect. Yes, absolutely. Those are good messages. Yeah. Thank you very much. Wait, no, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> Turns out you have somewhere to be. Oh, oh, really? I got, oh, but yeah. this is, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I know, you, you know what? Yeah. You can fuck up your place. <laughs> We are happy for you to stay. Uh, yeah, no. We have free food. We yes, have like yeah, some couches you could lie on. I love this. Um, but apparently you have to go like no. pay some bills. I got to pay some bills. Okay. <laughs> well, thank thank you guys very much. Is uh, this this has been spectacular? I, I know. know it's crazy. But you know what? I know. We have a little piece of a movie for you. Okay. We're gonna show you a featurette. Is what. Oh, we got a featurette. Hollywood. We have a featurette. Woo! Um, you probably seen it already. I so probably you seen it. Yeah. Oh, I get to go. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, oh, no. Run the track, run the track. I have to show up at work with the right attitude and with the positive energy. And uh, I actually uh, had a t-shirt made that said positive energy is a part of your job description, right? So the, the idea that um, I want to show up with the right energy, I want to show up, you know, we're all here, you know, even now we're all here, we're trying to feed our families, we're, we're trying to have a good time, we're trying, you know, they're, they're, this is an important uh, part of our lives, our time is all that we have. So to me it's hugely important to deliver positive energy in a way because it's viral. So in... I come with positive energy, and then someone else is going to pick up on the positive energy, and you're going to take it home to your families. And you know, so for me, it's just hugely important to approach everything and everybody at every turn with the 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 most uh, positive, loving kindness that I can generate. You told the famous story about how you kind of backed into acting Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Yeah. And the next thing you know, you start making these movies. And I forget that Bad Boys actually came before Independence Day, right? Yeah. And then, yeah. Bad Boys. Independence Day just was like one of the biggest of all time. Like, what was that transition like for you to be yeah, like a real know, actor and like the biggest actor in the game? No, nah, it was, it was um, that was like the first real um, goal like that in terms of setting goals. I was like, I want to be the biggest movie star in the world, mm. right? And every, uh, up until that point, everything was like, it was fun and it was happening and we were creating in Jeff's mom's basement and yeah. it was mm -hmm. successful. But that was like, when I moved into acting, that was the first time I started uh, applying uh, skill to my, my talents, right? And you know, I always look, I look at skill and talent separately. Like Pete, you're born with talent. You know, it's like there's certain things that you just do naturally. Mm -hmm. You were gifted with a talent and you have it. Um, but skill is acquired through discipline and, you know, I've never seen myself as particularly talented. Mm -hmm. Where I excel is I'm willing to die in the process of acquiring skill. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, you know, when I put my obsessive yeah. mind just on something, the I'm just dying. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's You're like, not gonna work. You also, you also said ridiculous and sickening work ethic. Sickening work <laughs> ethic, exactly. It's like, you know, so for me, to be a movie star was the first thing yeah. that I ever really wanted like that and set my He was like right, Schwarzenegger, sort of, Stallone, Bruce Schwarzen Willis. All of them. I I'm was like, I was like, you know, because when I, when I looked, I always felt like there, there weren't a lot of people I saw do things that I felt like I couldn't do, mm. right? When I, when I look at people and I see things, um, I, don't, I don't feel like I can't. W whether or not I will is something different, but I don't ever feel like I can't. It's funny, I learned a really valuable lesson in this, right? Because the, um, the, the network wanted to do one more season right. of The Fresh Prince. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was considering I was going to do one more season of The Fresh Prince. And we had we'd done an episode or something with John Amos. Okay. And John Amos came to me. He said, hey, man, listen. He's like, don't overstay your welcome on, on TV. He was like, you're, you're doing great stuff. He's like, you do not want to get canceled in the middle of a season. It's like, go out on your terms the way that you want to go out. Be able to say goodbye to your fans. Don't get caught. 
Okay. You know, that was good advice. And then, so this was the sixth season, and I had an opportunity to do one more season, but I was feeling like the quality wasn't necessarily going to stay up, okay. and I decided to to end the show okay. in the in the sixth season. Can you talk about advice that you're happy you didn't take at some point in your careers? Oh man. Ooh. Yeah. This one. Yeah. Sorry, mom. Um, <laughs> um, uh, one, of the, one of the most critical uh, for me, and and um, you know, it was uh, it was 1986, um, and Girls Ain't Nothing But Trouble came out in in June. So I had a I had a record out a month before I graduated from high school. Right. So first song, it was at pretty much just in Philly and, and you know, D.C., Jersey. It, it, it hadn't expanded yet, um, but it was time for me to start applying to college. And um, and, you know, my mother is a serious, uh, you know, educational disciplinarian. It's like education was everything for her. And she could tell that I was kind of feeling like maybe I didn't want to go to college. And, you know, she told me that, you know, if I didn't go to college, that I was throwing my life away. And and it's like I, I, I understood what she was saying, but that that just wasn't true for me. You know, that wasn't true for me at the time. And I wanted to take a shot at my art. I wanted to take a shot at the music. And, you know, so I, my, my father convinced my mother that I would have a year. They would give me a year where I would be able to pursue the, the music. And then if in a year I hadn't made anything happen, that, that I would go back to, to college. Um, and in that year, uh, we were nominated and we won the, the first Grammy ever <laughs> given. <laughs> You know, that's a hell of a 365. Well, my, you know. <laughs> I never did anything for money, right? So it was never, it was never about money. Um, my experience has been when people do things for money, you make bad choices. Find what you love, and then you'll learn how to make money doing what you love. When I when I changed careers, I was never changing to something for money. I was changing to something I love more. Right, and that, that to me, that's really the only way to keep the passion. If you have two choices, the one is playing the piano, and another one is you know, bowling. And you can make more money bowling, but you love playing the piano more. You got to play the piano. It's like you'll tear yourself apart if you're not doing the thing that you love most in life. And you know what it is right now. Right now, there's something that you love more than everything. I've never, I've never really thought about age and felt it that way. But like last year when I turned 50, it was like, it's, it's a five in front of it. Like the, the five, like 40 was cool, 30 right. was cool. Like 50 was like, whoa, man, we need to jump out a helicopter or something. <laughs> yeah, you know, it really, it, uh, it, it hit me a little bit. But the, the accepting uh, being older and even for Gemini men, a lot of those things came yeah, up. And you're thinking right, about right, right. the previous life and you think about the, the karma of the mistakes you've made mm -hmm. and what would you n not do, you know, if you, if you had known and all of those things came up. But, it, but uh, I've, I've solved the problem. I'm, I, am, I am having an absolute ball with my life right now. For me, it's, it, laughing is the elixir. You know, and that was another thing that my father taught me. He was he was joking all the way up to the end, like laughing. You, it, you have to be able to laugh at everything. Yeah. And for me, the beautiful part is uh, that that's my natural um, uh, color on the spectrum. I naturally go to comedy, you know, and when 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 I'm looking at something, I'm always trying to find why that's funny. Taking responsibility, accepting responsibility is not an admission of guilt. Like you're not you're not admitting that you're at fault. Taking responsibility is a recognition of the power that you seize when you stop blaming people. It, it's not like you're letting somebody who wronged you off the hook. Like taking responsibility is an act of emotional self-defense. Taking responsibility is taking your power back. The thing is, um, 
And, you know, when I when I started, I had, you know, all these grand ambitions of what I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. And, you know, I want to be the biggest movie star in the world. Um, so I studied that and I worked out and I got my body crazy and I did, you know, just got my head around um, doing everything I could do to be the biggest movie star in the world, you know. And then I had a taste of that. And I realized that even though I had achieved all those things, on the inside, I was still that same insecure little boy wow. that was trying to prove something, you know, uh -huh. to, to, you know, girls that had cheated and to my father and all of that. And that you can't achieve your way out of mm. your, you know, uh -huh. childhood wounds and uh -huh. traumas. You can't fake it. You can't fake it, yeah. right? So yeah. then I made the shift. And what I realized is that the only sustainable mission um, throughout your whole uh, existence is to improve lives. And as soon as I made the shift in my mind from trying to be big and trying to have money and trying to be popular to making sure that I improved lives every step, step of the way uh -huh. on this earth, then mm -hmm. all of a sudden I started experiencing healing. Uh -huh. You know, and Alfonso was one of those people that was right there with me making that transition from product and winning to love and people. Always, always a pleasure to talk to you. Always. Uh, this is such a, a different original story. So mm -hmm. what was your first thought when you got the script? Uh, I love the title, first of all, The Collateral Beauty. You know, the idea that uh, no matter how difficult a circumstance is, uh, if you stay conscious and aware, you'll be able to see something beautiful in it. I thought that was beautiful. Um, and then the idea of love, time, and death. You know, I just, the, you know, the way that they played out in the screenplay, I thought Alan Loeb wrote a, uh, just a gorgeous script. Yeah, and a very relatable story to all audiences all over yeah, the world. Yeah. Uh, as a parent, I'm sure finding, uh, you know, understanding his dark place is not difficult because it's such an yeah, intolerable idea. Absolutely. Uh, but what helped you understand his way back, his reconnection? You know, it was, it's, um, I've, I've always been, um, the, the type of person who uh, thought of I thought of myself as resilient, you know, that I could always make my way back. Being stuck in the past is a, it makes it extremely difficult to to find your way out. And future thinking for me has always been the way to get over mm -hmm. difficult times, to be able to look over the darkness to a potential time of light. Rarely do I look backwards. I'm always uh, looking forward. So both your kids are in showbiz too. Mm -hmm. uh, is that worrying for you? <laughs> or no, you know, not, it, it's, you know, to me showbiz is not separated from the rules of the universe, right? So whether you're in show business or, you know, you're selling cars or you're farming, you know, you're not, you're not separate from the, the laws of the universe and all of the rules are the same everywhere. So for, you know, for, for my children, the most important thing is that they be encouraged to fully and thoroughly be themselves no matter what. And when you, when you have yourself and you're thorough and confident in who you are, you can survive anywhere. I love this one. Fail early, fail often, fail forward. Um, you know, it's always a little bit frustrating to me when, when people have a negative relationship with failure. Failure is a massive part of being able to be successful. You have to get comfortable with failure. You have, you have to actually seek failure. Failure is where all of the lessons are. You know, when you go to the gym and you work out, you're actually seeking failure. You want to take your muscles to the point where you get to failure because that's where the, the adaptation is. That's where growth is. Successful people fail a lot. They fail a whole lot more than they succeed, but they extract the lessons from the failure and they use that that the, the energy and they use the wisdom to come around to the next phase of success. You gotta take a shot. You have to live at the edge of your capabilities. You gotta live where you're almost certain you're gonna fail. That's the reason for practice. Practice is controlled failure. You're getting to your limit, getting to your limit, getting to your limit. 
you can't lift that, you can't do that, you until you get to the point that all of a sudden your body makes the adjustment and then you can do it. Failure uh, actually helps you to recognize the areas where you need to evolve. So fail early, fail often, fail forward. I think it was 94 or something like that. They were open to Planet Hollywood. I found myself in a room with Arnold Schwarzenegger, Bruce Willis, and Sly. And I was like, oh my God, I got these three guys in the room. And I was like, okay, I wanna be the biggest movie star in the world. And I need you guys to tell me how to do it. And Arnold Schwarzenegger, he said, he said, if your movie is only big in America, it doesn't matter. You'll be a movie star only when you're a movie star in every country in the world. You have to travel, you have to go, you have to meet the people. Thanks for the tip. Facts, son, facts. That became the way that I started looking at movies. I wanted to be in every country in the world. In that part of my career, I refused to do anything that wasn't in the best interest of the goal I had set for myself. And it was probably a 12 year period of my life where I didn't take a drink. I didn't have a drink where I didn't go out on the weekends. I was so set on my goal. It created a serious circle of protection and, and elevation because I refused to do anything that wasn't in my best interest. It's hugely important that if you have a dream that you have to dedicate your life to it and there, every hour of every day has to be dedicated to bring it into fruition the things that you dream about. I just saw this uh, Rumi quote that I love. Set your life on fire and seek those who fan your flames. The Philly translation of that is don't be hanging with no jank ass jokers that don't help you shine. The prerequisite for spending time with any person is that they nourish and inspire you. They feed your flame. Look at your last five text messages. Are those people feeding your flames or dousing your fire? Put your phone down for just a second and look around. Look to the people around you. Are those people throwing logs on your fire or are they pissing on it? The people that you spend time with are gonna make or break your dreams. Everybody don't deserve to be around you. You gotta defend your light with your life. So who are the people in your life that are fanning your flames? It's like everybody was sitting at home looking at their devices, yeah. right? When what felt like a new atrocity to some people, but was happening over and over again for African-Americans and for this to happen in this time for the whole world, to see what we've been saying for hundreds of years. Yes. My grandmother taught me to try to be thankful for these times and these opportunities, to try to be thankful for your pain, you know? And we are in a circumstance that we've never been before. The entire globe has stood up and said to the African-American people, we see you and we hear you. How yeah. can we help? We've never been there before. You, you know, for, for me, it comes down to, you know, after you get beyond the rage, rage is, is justified under oppression. It also can be really dangerous. You gotta be careful not to be consumed by your own rage. Yeah. You know, and that's something that I've worked really hard on. And what I loved about the peaceful protests, it's like peaceful protests put up a mirror to the demonic imagery of your oppressor. And the more still you are in your peaceful protest, the more clear the mirror is to the oppressor for the world to see and for them to see themselves you know so i was really encouraged by how powerfully this generation was able to hold that mirror you know i think my, my dreams over the past you know couple of decades have been 
like, you know, physical dreams. I wanted to accomplish things. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to be the biggest movie star in the world. You um, did it. And, yeah, yeah, you, <laughs> you know, it. so you it was keep, all success-oriented. <laughs> and I think now, um, if you look at it away, like going up the mountain, I was acquiring. Right. And I guess as I come down on the other side, now I want to give it away. Right. So sort of the 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 dreams that I have is I, I want to be valuable, like I want to be valuable to humanity. I want to, you know, I haven't totally found my calling as of yet, but I want my life to be of value to as many people and in as many ways as possible. Nervous is great. It means you're outside your comfort zone where growth happens. Did you cut your hair? That looks nice, man. Besides, you never really needed permission to take matters into your own hands. That's Jaden on his brand new drum set. Happy or dive head first into the unknown. Jaden will officially be starring in my next movie with me. Or being courageous enough to try something new and persistent enough to stick to it for years even when it knocks you down. Or take challenges on way bigger than yourself. This is our first bottle of just water. You feel good about it? Guys, this is amazing. You've always had an interesting sense of self-expression. <laughs> but you take jabs like a champ and deal them back with effortless class. It's okay. No, true. I have a gut now, right? Be honest. We never really understood your thing with bugs, though. Hey, good. Seeing you roll around on the ground was a lot cuter when you were a baby. You were nervous. Shoot, I was nervous. But we did the damn thing out there. No! Why was the icon living? Why? You was born from an icon living. Yeah. That's around Magnia, icon living. Tequila. Do we make some icon children? You was raised in an icon village. Work hard to raise an icon ceiling. Yeah. One day I'ma hit you all the icon village. Yeah. Now, I'ma, I'ma be, be an icon, icon chiller. Let's go. We be from the village of Golasso. Put us through the streets of Picasso. No quiero que me hables de fracaso. Tú ponme lo que quieras que yo arraso. When I started in in entertainment, um, the lack of tech was a massive creative hindrance, hmm. right? It was um, you could have an idea, and it literally could take you a month before you could get the resources together to get the idea out of your mind onto something you could listen to, okay. right? With music, okay. um, and with film, it was impossible. If you had if you had images in your mind, you know, and with a Super 8 camera to try to shoot something and then try to sync something, it was literally impossible. So two things happened with that. So with one with rap music, what happened was only the best of the best got through, right? Okay. So 1986, the summer that uh, me and Jeff released our first album, I, if I named all the rappers, you would know who they were, because you, it was you know, Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Friends, Heavy D, Eric Beer, Rakim, Public Enemy, it's like you did, you couldn't get through. Yeah. So then what happens with technology, as soon as technology gets democratized, then everybody can do it, mm -hmm. and now more things get out and there's a, a lesser quality to the things that That's make true. it to, to the world. So I would say uh, technology is an absolute um, necessity to advance human imagination. You differentiate though between talent and hard work. Absolutely. You wrote, I've never really viewed myself as particularly talented. I view myself as you know, slightly above average in talent. Where I excel is ridiculous, sickening work ethic. You know, mm -hmm. while the other guy's sleeping, I'm working. While the other guy's eating, I'm working. While the other guy's making love, well, I mean, I'm making love too, but I'm working, working really, really hard, hard at it. I'm working really hard at it. <laughs> so when the phone rings and you have an alarm goes 
Amazon right, says right. Denzel Washington right now is hooking up. You got to go at know, it right, right now, right? <laughs> you know, for, for me, man, it's, it's like the, the, the separation of talent and skill is one of the, 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 the greatest misunderstood concepts for people who are trying to excel, who have dreams that want to do things. Talent you have naturally. Skill is only developed by hours and hours and hours of beating on your craft. And, you know, for me, it's I, I feel like I have a relationship with the audience. They agree that they're going to go in droves. And I agree that every time they go, it's going to be better than the last time. So I think that's part of the, the, the relationship. And I'm going to hold up my part as long as they keep holding up theirs. I think that the important thing is that there's there's one relationship that you have to maintain, and that's the one with you. Right. And it's like if if you're not loving you, if you're not taking care of you, everything and everybody is second mm -hmm. to you taking care of you. Can you come back tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, you need to let that breathe. Right <laughs> um, when when you have bad relationships. And, and when things go wrong, which they, which they always will. It's like, you know, me and Jada be going at it, me and, me and my kids. You know, there's heavy debates around things a lot. But first and foremost, when you are steady and calm in yourself, it makes it easier to manage the insanity that other people are going to bring to you. Because like, as soon as somebody else is off the hook, if you respond to off the hook with off the hook, the relationship's done. Yeah. You know, so it's like taking care of you, centering yourself. The, air, the airline got it right. Put your mask on first uh -huh. before attempting to assist others. Okay. <laughs> well, but you had great success, obviously, at the box office, but, you know, you did your thing on a small screen, too. It's yeah. a little show called The Fresh Prince. Yeah, man. And it was like... It was ridiculous. Quincy just... He knows how to put stuff together. And, and I don't... Uh, relentlessly on me to elevate. Like, James Avery wouldn't give me a damn inch like everything I said, everything I did for James Avery was like, nope, not good enough. You know, he was like, if you, you have this position, look where you are, look what you are blessed with. Mm -hmm. He was like, I'm sorry, but I'm not accepting anything other than absolute uh, committed perfection from you. And at that time, I was balling, you know, so I was like, you know. <laughs> and James Avery wouldn't give me nothing. And it's like, he was, he was the model for me of an actor, mm -hmm. you know. Craft so uh, the craft, it's like James Avery was no, like he was so uh, like serious. And like, I would look at him and, and he just had that acting power that I wanted to have, right? Mm -hmm. My parents drove us uh, cross country to, we were going to California for a uh, family reunion. So we drove to the Grand Canyon and we got there and I like, I remember having a deeply meaningful experience of how beautiful it was, but I was terrified to walk up to the edge. And all my brothers and sisters and my whole family walked up to the edge and I stayed back. <laughs> you know, just scared to, to take in beauty. If you're scared, you're not going to take the chances that you need to take to, to realize your dreams. And that was the thing for me. I don't mind being scared, but I'm still going to do it. Life is hard, right? Like, yeah, you might get hurt. It's yeah. like... You know, your, you, your, your heart might get broken, you know? It's like you might lose your job, but you still got to commit, you know? Hey. You got to commit, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? And it's like, you know, you meet somebody and you, hey, you know, you like her and she likes you and you're hesitating. Don't hesitate. <laughs> Go. Commit. You got to commit, you know? You might get hurt. You might lose something. But it's like you can't experience the, the joy that is intended for you in life if you don't go. I think what makes a great MC is the same thing that makes a great father, makes a great husband, makes a great politician, makes a great human being. And it is your commitment to your personal evolution, your personal growth for the purpose of assisting others. Mm -hmm. Like, um, 
you know, I'm working on this record now called, uh, um, it's called The Mountaintop. Mm. And the, the idea is I've been to the mountaintop, mm. right? And it's like, I'm going to do reports from the summit, right? Mm. I've been to the top of money. I've, I've had all the sex that I've ever wanted. I've had all of the adulation and, and adoration. And I've been to the top of all of those material world mountains. Mm. And nothing makes you happy other than being useful to others. That's it. That's the only thing that ever will satisfy that thing is that what you are is useful. One of the favorite things I love to do is create uh, awe-inspiring experiences that cultivate growth, that cultivate wisdom, that, you know, elevate uh, understanding. Right. So when I go somewhere with my kids, um, I always want to push them. I just want to push the envelope slightly. And yet, as you say, you get out of that comfort zone just a little bit, that's where your growth space mm -hmm. is. So watching somebody uh, experience wonder and awe and grow, that's, I, I just love to do, however we can build that. So me and Jada was reflecting about love. And I asked her, I said, what does she think was you know, one of the biggest revelations that she had had about love. She said that you cannot make a person happy. And I thought that was a real deep idea. You can make a person smile, you can make a person feel good, you can make a person laugh, but whether or not a person is happy is deeply and totally and utterly out of your control. I remember the day um, I retired. I literally said to Jada, that's it. I retire. I retire from trying to make you happy. I need you to go make yourself happy and just prove to me that it's even possible. And after we cracked the hell up, um, we started talking about we came into this false romantic concept that somehow when we got married that we would become one. And what we realized is that we were two completely separate people on two completely separate individual journeys. And that we were choosing to walk our separate journeys together. But her happiness was her responsibility and my happiness was my responsibility. And we decided that we were going to find our individual, uh, internal, private, separate joy. And then we were going to present ourselves to the relationship and to each other already happy. Not coming to each other, uh, begging with our empty cups out, uh, demanding that she fill my cups, the cup, and demanding that she meet my needs. It's unfair and it is, it's kind of uh, unrealistic and can be destructive to place the responsibility for your happiness on anybody other than yourself difference between depression and joy, right? And I think it's purpose, right? It's like when you wake up in the morning and your life means something to somebody other than you, that you have a purpose. If you don't go do the things that you're going to do, people's lives will suffer. And I think that that kind of purpose, that like to live in service, not to you, but to live in service to humanity, to live in service to your family, to live in service to your church, to your city, to your country, to the world, living in service is that I, uh, I feel like that is the purest form of joy. Greatness is not this um, wonderful, esoteric, elusive uh, God-like feature that only the special among us are, will ever taste. You know, it's something that truly exists in all of us. It's very simple. This is what I believe, and I'm willing to die for it. Yeah. Period.
It's that simple. I know who I am, and I know what I believe. I know who I am, I know who, what I believe. that's all I need to know. And that's all I, I need to know. know. So from there, you do what you need to do. Yeah. You know, and I think what happens is we make the situation more complex than it has to because be. Because we're looking for complexity. There's got to be Absolutely. something complex to understand. It greatness. can't be that easy. The separation of talent and skill is one of the, 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 the greatest misunderstood concepts for people who are trying to excel, who have dreams that want to do things. Talent you have naturally. Skill is only developed by hours and hours and hours of beating on your craft. There's no easy way around it. No matter how talented you are, your talent is going to fail you if you're not skilled. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't study, if you don't work uh, really hard and dedicate yourself to being better every single day, mm -hmm. you'll never be able to communicate with, with people. Rejection is everywhere, you know. We all deal with the... the you don't anymore. Well, oh, yeah. oh my, sure yeah, don't. me worst of all, me worst of all. You know, I think the, the idea of rejection is relative. I mean, if you, you take a, a, you know, a kid in a small town and somebody post something negative about them and all of their friends laugh, you know, that's the worst rejection a human being can experience. It's not, you know, for that kid, it's not any less than for my kids who read it in a, on a comment page. You know, it's, it's emotionally, it's, it's the same. My kids grew up in this world, so they're much more acclimated to the difficulties of this world, but it doesn't make it uh, emotionally um, uh, more difficult or more painful than for any other child who has to deal with it. You're like the prince, but now you're the king of Instagram. Man. I know. <laughs> now. So it's like, how come you've embraced social media in this way? Like, because for the longest, you know, you have this mystique behind you. Well, in, you know, when I, when I started, the, the, the only way to be a movie star was through... Uh, distance and mystery and mystique, right? That was the 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 way. Is that you know? Down, it, yeah, 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 you yeah. could see me on July Fourth in the movie theater, or <laughs> right. you're not gonna see me, right. right? So that was the way. Keeping that distance was how you maintained uh, star power. Star power, yeah. and in the last five years, that shifted uh, much more to a friendship model. Like people support. Um, artists that they feel like they know thoroughly that they're friends, right? So that the social media, the the daily interaction is much more like a family friendship kind of interaction mm. that is an audience demand for uh, for you know their loyalty. Mm -hmm. But is there such thing as revealing too much? Um, not in this world. Mm. Um, too much that that's it's personal, you know. Mm. Like it's it's. What can you handle? You know, I think one of the major, um, one of the, the beautiful parts of social media that I think is a beautiful evolutionary thing is that social media demands uh, authenticity, mm. right? So social media pushes you more and more into having to reveal what's true. Because yeah, really if are. you don't, you know, TMZ is going to, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a fact. <laughs> you know, so it's, um, you know, it's a beautiful thing. I'm, and I'm actually enjoying the push, mm -hmm. right? Nobody's happy who doesn't get to be themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the eyes and ears of the world are starting to demand more and more authenticity, where mm -hmm. you got to say what's true yeah. for you and live or die by what that is. So I'm enjoying the, uh, the social demand for authenticity. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. coming into a space. How, how have you maintained your authenticity? Because, I mean, you come from Philly, you've gone through everything. Like, your journey's been crazy. Like, how have you maintained that? Um, you know, it's really interesting. It's, it's like... The, the idea, I, I, I haven't maintained my authenticity per se. Mm. I've maintained my character, right? I've maintained um, my beliefs, character in two senses. I've maintained my character of Will Smith, and I've maintained my personal character of what I believe in. Mm. So, but in terms of authenticity, um, the character 
Will Smith signs every autograph and is always happy and wants to see the fans and is always in a good mood. Mm -hmm. And that's actually not authentic, mm. right? I actually, I do want to slap some, somebody, <laughs> you know, <laughs> every once in a while. So in terms of authenticity, I, I have successfully maintained positivity and now I'm working more to maintain authenticity. I'm granting myself the freedom to not give a fuck when I don't give a fuck, yeah. right? And now I'm working into a space of much more uh, authenticity. I'm motivated by fear. Fear. You know? Um, fear of what? Fear of fear. I hate being scared to do something. Yeah. I hate that feeling of the feeling that I had before I had a meeting with Quincy Jones because it was really uh, Quincy Jones and a guy named uh, Benny Medina oh, I know Benny. and Jeff Pollock know, came right. with the idea Real. for the right. Fresh Prince right. of Bel Air, and I hated being scared, you know, that, that I didn't want to even take the meeting. Yeah. There were there were opportunities during uh, when I first uh, my first year as a rapper. Bill Cosby and the, and the people on the Cosby Show had seen my music video and called me to be a character be, on, to come right. and try out for the Cosby Show. And just every time it was set up, for some reason, I couldn't make it. The and fear of fear. The fear. I hated. I just hated that being scared to do something. And I think what developed uh, in my in my early days was the the attitude that. I started attacking things that I was scared of. You a better man than me? You happy? Now, you gonna tell Will or not? I'm not gonna do your dirty work for you. Fine. Uh, I'll call him from the road. Yeah, then why don't you do that? Yeah, I'll do that. Daddy O! What's up? Will, <laughs> I'm glad you're here. Um. Some business came up I got a handle. So we're going to have to put a, our trip on hold. You understand? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, cool. that's cool. Just for a couple of weeks. Mm, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a little longer. Yeah, whatever, whatever. Look, I'll, I'll call you next week and we'll iron out the details, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, yeah. It was great seeing you, son. You too. Lou? Yeah. Yeah, um... I'm sorry, Will. You know what, actually, this works out better for me. You know, the Slimmies of Summer come to class wearing next to nothing, you know what I'm Will, saying? Will, it's all right to be angry. Hey, why should I be mad? I'm saying, at least he said goodbye this time. I just wish I hadn't wasted my money buying this stupid present. I'm sorry. I, you know, if there was something that I Hey, could you know do. what? You ain't got to do no, nothing, Uncle Phil. Hey, you know, ain't like I'm still five years old, you know? Ain't like I'm going to be sitting up every night asking my mom, when's daddy coming home, you know? Who needs him? Hey, he wasn't there to teach me how to shoot my first basket, but I learned, didn't I? Hey, I got pretty damn good attitude, didn't I, yeah, Uncle Phil? Did. Got through my first day without him. Right? Mm -hmm. I learned how to drive. I learned how to shave. I learned how to fight without him. I had 14 great birthdays without him. He never even sent me a damn card. Die out with him! I ain't need him then and I don't need him now. Will. Nah, you know what, Uncle Phil? I'm going to get through college without him. I'm going to get a great job without him. I'm going to marry me a beautiful honey, and I'm going to have me a whole bunch of kids. I'm going to be a better father than he ever was. And I sure as hell don't need him for that, because ain't a damn thing he could ever teach me about how to love my kids. How come he don't want me, man? I realized that when to, to have the level of success 
that I, I want to have. It's difficult to spread it out and do multiple things. You know, it's, it's in order to to be world class. And I've made a decision. I want to be world class. And it just it takes such a desperate, obsessive focus yeah. to to excel on a certain on, on the level that that I want to make movies. You know, I was a. Uh, Star Wars. When I was young, I sat in a movie theater and watched Star Wars, and I just couldn't believe that that movie made me feel like that, just floored and just stunned by the creativity. And just I'm realizing that in order to move people in that way, in order to touch people in that way, you really got to focus with all of your fiber and all of your heart and all of your creativity. As a child, my parents always told me, you could be whatever you want to be. You could do whatever you want to do. And you know, that, that office, that position, the, the highest office on the face of the earth, it was something, I heard my parents saying it, but I didn't totally believe it. Yet I went out in the world and I carried myself and I held my head high and I stood there and I looked people in their eyes and I talked to people as if I was deservant of everything that this planet has to offer. So I just, I really want to say to, to children out there and to, to people who are watching, Confucius said one time, he who says he can and he who says he can't are both usually right. So I want to stand here before you and as I hold this award, I want to give love to my wife and I want you to keep in your heart, just know that you can. Know that you can. The greatest thing in my in my career has been the constant commitment to putting something in the world of value, mm -hmm. not putting something in the world that makes me look hot, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, so I think as long as you can stay focused on delivering your art and delivering yourself and delivering your energy and delivering your ideas for the world to be better, you know, I've always been really product oriented, mm -hmm. you know? It's like, I wanna win. When I do something, I want to win, I want it to be number one, and I want to smash it. And I had a period, I, you know, I have a daughter now, I was I have a 15-year-old daughter, and she really, she got me and shifted uh, my focus from product to people. It took a couple of years, but as soon as I got knocked off of product and started shifting to people, the whole world opened up for me again, and acting opened up in a whole new way to not go into day one of a movie trying to figure out what everybody has to do so we win versus opening up and every person's a new, uh, it's a whole new world. People mean meaning the characters you play or the people you work with? Both. Absolutely. You know, generally when I went into a product, when I went into a meeting with a director, my focus was can this guy win? Can this girl win? Mm. And that it was a, it was a, you know, it was a, a pathology that got broken for me a couple of years ago. And then releasing that and just wanting to connect with people and wanting to grow and wanting to get new ideas and have new experiences that don't have to have uh, a, an outcome. It just opened up a whole new world for me and I fell in love and then I couldn't imagine what else I could do in acting that could add so much to my life. Do you get nervous or afraid? Uh, I, I live in complete terror, <laughs> like, you know, for, <laughs> everything for me uh, about this business and, uh, and uh, you know, about what I've been trying to build and what I've been trying to do with my life keeps me in terror. I'm, I am deeply motivated by fear. I'm surprised you say you're, you live in fear. How do mm. you deal with that? Do you turn to somebody for advice? Do you meditate? Well, how, how do you get over that? You know, I'm, I'm trying to, to develop a more realistic perspective of what this business is. I told my mother this the, the other day, and she thought it was hilarious. I said, when, when I was 15 years old, my first girlfriend cheated on me. Oh. And I remember making a decision that nobody would ever cheat on me again, and the way I was going to do that is by being the biggest actor on earth. Huh. Right? So 
is there's the, there's been this weird psychology that I've always felt like if my movies are number one, my life is going to work out great. Huh? You know, and like oh, that's just you funny. shut up. <laughs> Bright goes out to what, 190 countries, um, hundreds of millions of people see it, but it's not in theaters. Mm -hmm. So for two artists, what is the unique satisfaction of this? You know, so for me, it's really experimental. What I learned uh, when Independence Day came out. So I, was, I had been doing The Fresh Prince, and that Friday before Independence Day came out, everybody was, Will, Will, Will. That Monday was the first time that anybody ever called me Mr. Smith, right? So there's something about that big screen, that massive blockbuster that does something inside of people emotionally. So I'm curious as to see, because Netflix is doing all of the other stuff. Absolutely. You know, it's exactly the same production process, the promotion, everything is exactly the same you would do for a gigantic blockbuster. And the question is, will the emotional resonance, the sort of n nostalgic residue a year, two years, three years from now, still be there with people not experiencing it in the overwhelming fashion of the cinema. So you're just, this is an experiment and we'll see how it works we'll out. We'll see how it goes, yeah, but it's definitely the future. You know, I got the call from Ridley and he said, uh, he said, I've got a gift for you. And uh, he, he sent me a concussion. And uh, you know, I read it immediately, and I remember thinking, uh, this, "This ain't no damn gift." <laughs> I was like, "I'm a football dad." Yeah, right, so right, you right, know, right, right. for for me, it was a beautiful uh, screenplay, but it opened up a huge conflict for me. Yeah, Did I'm, you know about about what had happened before? Did you know the story a little bit really of him? Vaguely, or? okay. Really vaguely, I, I knew. Uh, you know, my son played football for, for four years. Right. Um, and during that time, I had never heard uh, about the, the concussion yes. issue okay. at all. At all, okay. So, you know, I, it, it was part of what really uh, inspired me and made me want to to do the, the film, forced me to, to have to, to do the film, is because as a parent, I had no idea. Right. I had no idea that there was a, an issue with an issue, repetitive yeah. head trauma right, right. In, in football. Right. You know, so it was, a, uh, it was a, quite, quite a revelation. A personal confrontation with death made me see the value of time and the fact that the only elixir is love. You know, so the, the, the time that you spend has got to be in preparing yourself and giving and receiving uh, the most amount of love you can. My mission is to improve lives. Uh, so I want to do things that put positivity and positive energy and love into the world. So I'm going to put on this uh, orc mask because I can't walk the floor at Comic-Con as me. And out in the middle with everybody. I think I'm a with people. <laughs> All right, so now I feel sorry for Joel. <laughs> All in all is safe, but if we go out in public, I'm gonna kill somebody. So let, let's go. And I never get to do this. This is gonna be great. I'm gonna get to walk around. It's hard to see and it's hard to breathe, but I'm a soldier, so I don't need neither one of them things. I'm on bar. I'm on bar. Oh, sorry.
finding your purpose. Like that's a that's a that's a big one. Just keep trying stuff. Just keep trying. You got to keep keep going. And uh, and in terms of finding purpose, it was helpful for me to realize that just because everybody in Philly believed you know one thing and one set of ideas and everybody in Philly was in a certain paradigm as soon as I got out of the city and out of the country I realized there were people that didn't give a damn about stuff that was the most important thing in the world try experiment meet travel um, that was a big part for me and that's a lot of what you're gonna see on my YouTube channel too like travel is huge I went to a Catholic school uh, up to eighth grade with uh, all white kids and probably two or three black kids, but you know, predominantly white school. And then I went to my neighborhood high school in ninth grade that was 99% black kids. Um, so the first day that I, I walk in to ninth grade, I walked into the lunchroom and you know, it was like 500 kids and for, to this day, I don't know why I did this. I'm sure it was because I was, I was nervous and you, you know, I, got the, I have a thing with fear. I don't like being scared. So I'm sure I, was, I walked in, uh, I looked around and I said, excuse me, can I have your attention? Can I have your attention, please? He's here. He's here right now. Thank you. Thank you. People was kind of looking and there was this one dude and he was sitting there and he looked up to me, he said, man, don't nobody give a that you hear, right? And I said, hey, just give me 10 minutes, your girl gonna care, right? And he was like, all right. And you gotta watch that nod. That nod is not a good nod. He was like, and I was like, okay. So I went, so I'm walking up the steps, we're out of the lunchroom and I had forgot about it. So we're going and I'm walking up the steps and he had taken one of those combination locks and he put the lock in the palm of his hand and put, his, put the, uh, the loop around his knuckle. And he was holding the lock in his hand. And as I was walking up the steps, he cracked me in the side of my head with the lock. And I went down, I was out, I don't remember nothing. I still got the lump on my head. You can't see it because I got my hair, but I still, like, there's still a lump. So I remember I fell down, I hit my mouth on the steps, all of that stuff. You know, so I went up, so I'm in the principal's office, all of that, the police come, and I got the ice on my lips, and I'm, I'm sitting in the principal's office. And my father comes in, he sees me, and, and you know, I'm telling the story, now the police are there. And I remember I saw this kid, they put him in handcuffs and took him out of the school. And I'm looking, sitting in the principal's office and I'm watching the police take him out and put him in the back of a police car. And I just couldn't believe it had escalated to a kid being removed from, from school. And I was laying in my bed that night and I was just feeling like shit. And I had the recognition that I had caused this kid to throw his life away, right? And he was kicked out of school and I never knew what, what happened to him, but I, I, I have a sense that it, it, it didn't go well beyond there and I felt a deep sense of regret and a deep sense that I had caused an emotion in a person that made them do that. And that, that feeling of regret turned into a sort of a fear of how much power I had. And I was like, everything I say and do has that kind of effect on other human beings. And in that moment, I decided that I would never walk into a room and do anything other than inspire and uplift and enlighten people and help people to be the greater versions of themselves and I would never do anything that would cause people to, or to rile up the darkest, dirtiest parts of people. I only wanted to enliven and enlighten and inspire. And I remember laying in my bed that night 
and I made that promise to myself and I made that promise to God. And it's something that has completely shaped how I approach people, how I approach moments, how I walk into rooms, how I deal with every human being on this earth. All right, All right. here's what's gonna happen. Twitch is gonna ask us each to name three things, of uh, three types of like cars or something, and we'll have five seconds to name three things and then hit that yeah. to see how much time is left on the clock. Okay. All right? If you do it, you get a point. If time runs out, you get no points at all. Five seconds Ooh. goes very, very fast. Okay. I shall go first. You shall go first. Okay. Okay. Ellen, yes. name three things you do in a car. Uh, you drive, you park, and you uh, uh, say hello to people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you do uh, when you wave it. No, you do. When you're driving, no, no. have you ever lived in a small town? You do. You wave to people. All right, all right. Okay, all right. I see. I see. Now we need some like judges and stuff. All right. <laughs> you drive. You you say hi. You wink. You wink. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Will. Yes. Name three things you should never do in a car. Never uh, uh, drink, uh, smoke, make love. That's not true. That's not true. That's not true. But you shouldn't do it. I mean, no. you should do it at home. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I see it's hard. It, see, is, it's hard. Hard. it is hard. It is hard. hard. <laughs> okay, Ellen, uh. tell us three words you use a lot. Uh, uh, love, uh, baby, and uh, be kind. Yeah, be kind. <laughs> the be kind. I'm going to yeah. give you that one because yeah. that's the right answer. Yes, that's that right is right. right. <laughs> that's the right answer. It's two words. Yeah. It's two words. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Will, name your three favorite songs to sing in the shower. In the shower. Uh, the, the, the Dream Girls, uh, the, the, I'm telling you, um, Whitney Houston's, uh, oh, darn. Yeah, but that's, uh, it's like the, and I am telling you, I'm not going. You're the best man I've ever known. There's no way I could ever go. No, 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 no way. No, 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 no way. I'm living with that's my song. I used to be able to, to eat whatever I want, and then in six weeks I could get in any shape I wanted to get into, but that's not the case anymore. We're, we're around the 12 or 14 week uh, uh, mandatory uh, training to, to do anything, but, but I love it. I'm, I, enjoy, um, I enjoy the discipline of it. For me, working on on your body is the beginning of everything. You know, your mind starts to work better, you're a, a better husband, a better father, a better friend, and life is just better when you, you know, care for your body at the highest level. You know, growing up, my mother and father and grandmother demanded no less of me than to represent the family every time I stepped out in a way that was helpful to others. The city gave him his start. He's worked hard and the city has worked hard for him. Knowing that this man is from West Philly opens eyes for them. They, they, it opens their lens. When you're in Philadelphia, you see a lot of things in the youth and the neighborhoods that not always positive and I think Seeing that will, will motivate you all in his own because you're always going to want something better for yourself. You don't have enough role models out here. You got too many kids being led astray, thinking the wrong things is what's good. They grow up too fast. Mm -hmm. You need people that's putting that out there like you don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. It's so much easier being yourself. When you are a young kid and you walk into school and you see images like this, it makes you aspire to want to be that person, right? What he's done in his life vibrated all your overseas to touch you and to touch people yeah, around the world. But yeah. this right here will affect people. Yeah. The main thing you did, let me tell you the yeah. main detail. Yeah. You got Will's ears right. <laughs> this man who is an icon is looking at GLA. So my kids every day will see this image and know that you can be whatever you want to be. This is a man who grew up in Philadelphia, went to Overbrook High School up the street, was a part of this world that he now is looking at us and telling my children, you can be whatever you want to be. That's, it's just so powerful. If you're a kid here growing up now and you see this every day, 
it can give you a real understanding that this guy is me. You know, he lived here, he grew up here, he had the same chances as me, the same possibilities as me, the same everything. And he's being painted on a wall because he's done something incredible with his life. We're about to make history. We are doing an IG Live to the International Space Station. It, oh yeah, and see, now that's the thing. Look, I'm doing it like that. Everybody can't do an interview to the International Space Station. In terms of like the, the simple basics, right? So you on Earth, people have to poop. You're like, it's important to poop on Earth. Right, so when you're up there, I see your microphone <laughs> floating. I need to understand what you do with that. Like, how do you manage that? Well, are you sure you want to talk about this, uh, this problem? Because it is pretty challenging. Um, <laughs> I like to say you can have a good day in the bathroom and you can have a really bad day in the bathroom. And you, really, you hope for the good days. The bad days can be challenging. On Earth, we talk about the, the, you know, the Mile High Club. Has anyone, you know, attempted, for research purposes, has anyone attempted, you know, the process of procreating the human species uh, in space? All right, well, similar to the last question, I'll just say, are you sure we want to talk about this on the interview? <laughs> I'm just, you know, I, I'm a man of the people, Drew. I'm a man of the people. And it's important to me to ask the questions that the people want the answers to. I'll just say, as far as I know, I have no knowledge of those tests being done. Uh, <laughs> but I can imagine that that would present some unique opportunities. Now, I've got a really special bonus clip that I think you're going to enjoy. But before that question of the day, I want to know what is the single greatest lesson you learned today from Will Smith? Let me know. Put it down in the comments below. And if you made it this far in a video, you're still here watching. I want to celebrate you because Believe Nation, we don't just watch videos. We do something about it. So if that's you and you commit, you promise you're going to take action immediately after watching this video. Give me a hashtag Believe down in the comments and tell me where you're from because I I want to celebrate you. Me and Jeff had come out with our smash hit. Parents just don't understand. We made a bunch of money. We won a Grammy album, was triple platinum. I had motorcycles and cars. I called the Gucci store in Atlanta and I was like, hey, will y'all close it down if I bring my friends? And I'm smiling, but that's stupid. We released our next album and it was like a flop. It was a tragedy. It went like double plastic. I had spent most of my money, like all of it. I spent all my money. And I didn't forget, but I didn't pay the IRS. In my mind, I mean, I wasn't like trying to avoid paying taxes. I was just like, oh damn, they need their money. The IRS took all, took all of that stuff. So I was like, broke, broke, broke. Being famous and broke is a shitty combination. Cause you're still famous and people recognize you, but they recognize you while you sit next to them on the bus. And the stuff they ask you to sign on a bus, you know, like, oh, can you sign my baby? That's a Sharpie. I, I probably shouldn't just write on the baby with that. Oh, you too big to sign my baby. Well, no, nah, I mean, you know, so I signed it. So I was like laying around and my girlfriend was like, dude, we're not doing this. Like, you're not just gonna be laying around this house all day. You're gonna go do something. And I was like, what? What I'm supposed to do? Go where people is is doing it. Wh where people doing it? Go to the Arsenio Hall show. Just go stand around at the Arsenio Hall show. Yes. That's stupid. So I went to the Arsenio Hall show and I met a dude named Benny Medina. And Benny Medina is the real life Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, except he actually went from Watts to Beverly Hills. Same basic concept, way shorter distance. I meet Benny and he pitches me the idea for this show and I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm not an actor. I'm like, cool. And he says, hey, you know, I want you to meet Quincy Jones. Quincy Jones is producing with me. So I find myself at Quincy's and there's actors and artists and celebrities and politicians, like everybody's at Quincy's house. It's like the Wiz without the costumes. 
So Benny walks me in and introduced me to Quincy. And like, hey, Q, what's up, man? He's like, hey, man, you know, I saw your music videos. I love, I love what you're doing. I love what you're doing. Tell me your rap name again. They call me the Fresh Prince. All right, good. That's what we're going to call the show. And he handed me a screenplay for a failed Morris Day pilot. Like, I don't have the time. So, I need you to do this. I need you to go ahead and take a few minutes, take 10 minutes, study the script, and I'm gonna clear all the stuff out the living room, and we're gonna have everybody sit down in the living room, we're gonna do an audition. He had movers that could reset his furniture. I was like, this dude is real. So he goes out and tells everybody, come on, come on, come on. And I was like, hey Q, hold up, man, hold up. I'm not ready to do no audition. And he said, like, oh, all right, all right. All right. Uh, well, what you need? Tell me what you need. Just set the meeting for a week and I could do it. He said, yeah, yeah, you know, Brandon Tartikoff, the head of NBC, is out there. I'll get him to schedule for next week. And then you know what's gonna happen? Something gonna come up and then he's gonna have to reschedule. Oh, yeah, yeah, so three, so three weeks from now, Q, we can do it three weeks from now. I said, yeah, 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 three weeks from now be good. Or you could take 10 minutes right now and you can change your life forever. And I was like, it then. Yes, give me 10 minutes. I said yes, and I let it rip. And I got to the end, and everybody is clapping. Quincy looks at Brandon Tartikoff, the head of NBC. Did you like it? And Brandon said, yeah, yeah, I liked it, Quincy. He says, no, did you like it? And he's like, yeah, I liked it. He's like, good, you're his lawyer. If you want another awesome video in our Black Excellence series, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there.